Okay, thanks everyone for joining. This is GW Coders for those watching online. Um, I don't really have many announcements. Most of the library coding workshops and stuff are starting to wrap up for this semester, um, but then we'll start having more again in the spring. Um, Mike will be here at some point, hopefully, and toward the end, he can talk about what's going on with um, code nights and when they're going to try to get those started. Um, last I had heard, they're going to be monthly, and he had a location for them, but I'm not sure where that was. But I don't think they've actually scheduled one yet. Um, does anyone else have announcements? <sighs> Code for America thing? Yep. <laughs> yeah, so the Code for America thing is coming. They have a call for proposals. It's here in DC. Um, if you are accepted as a presenter, it said in the FAQs that you get conference registration and then a $200 honorarium. So it's probably worth, if you're thinking about going, worth applying. Um, so, and that's on the Slack. Um, if you're new to coders and you don't have access to our Slack, drop me a message in the chat room or by email, and we'll get you added to our Slack. We post quite a few things there. Um, so we have one more GW coders for the fall, which will be the first Wednesday in December the 6th, I believe. Um, the tentative topic is, and we and discuss it at the end. We wanted to talk about ethics in coding and looking at both some of the traditional ethical issues, but also some of the newer things, like if you're using Copilot and you're getting other people's code through Copilot, how do you um, think about that from an ethics perspective and how should you going forward? Um, and of course, there's lots of new ethical dilemmas coming around with GPT-3 and other AI systems that can help write papers for students and this and that. So we want to talk about some of those issues. Um, and then we'll start to schedule for the spring. If anyone would like to present on a topic, please drop me an email. Um, John and I have topics, but at some point we are going to run out of ones that we can do. So the more students and others that we can get involved in talking about what you're doing and sharing what your code is, um, the more entertaining it will be for everyone. Um, though we've had a good variety this semester. We've had alumni, we've had students. Mm -hmm. um, and today we have Garrett, who's a GW alumni out of the econ department. Um, and he lives out in Fairfax, has his own business, um, and does really cool things, mostly with Python, but with other things as well. Um, but what he's gonna talk about today is around how to get your code to run more efficiently, specifically looking at Python again, um, though others may have parallels for what you could do similarly in R um, or other languages, uh, and so. So with that, I'll turn it over to you, Garrett, if you want to give a short introduction, um, maybe, or you can just jump right in either way. Um, he's sharing screen, so everyone should be able to see the code. He has this in a Jupyter notebook that he'll put on the GitHub that we'll put onto the GW Coder site. So you can have access to the code. And of course, the video will be along with it. Cool, thank you very much, Ryan. Like. Ryan said, hey everybody, I'm Garrett. Um, I'm a private federal contractor. I work with the US Commodities and Futures Trading Commission. And I do a lot of things there, but I work with mainly with their cloud infrastructure, setting that up. And um, I design algorithms to identify uh, microstructure manipulation in the commodities markets. So uh, that might not mean much to anybody, but I often like to just tell people I'm a white collar bounty hunter because <laughs> I think it's awesome. <laughs> but my job is a lot is much more boring than that. So uh, that's me. Anyways, today I mainly just wanted to talk about, so Ryan just mentioned, he said, making your Python code more efficient. And I think 
I'm kind of doing that in this lecture. However, I'd like to emphasize my goal here is what I'm about to talk about, I'm about to provide you an example function that I want to make faster. But I want to start off by saying, I want to assume that this function is fixed. It's just some random function that someone has given me. How do I make this function faster without actually editing the code that's been provided to me? And this is important because I don't want people to go away from this and think that like doing this is the right way. What you should do is you should try to make your code as fast as possible within the normal <laughs> confines of Python. Okay, so that means like if you're using a bunch of for loops, you should really rethink that because Python is an extremely slow language and you don't want to use for loops if you can avoid them. You know, if you can get your stuff to work in a NumPy array or you're using pandas or something like that. Um, you know, there's lots and lots of different options, you know, using group by using pre-built functions. A lot of the stuff, you know, when people are coding, almost always they're gonna be using C Python. So your Python being built on top of C. So using that pre-built stuff, you'll be able to tap into the lower engine C and that will work a lot faster than, you know, um, having to do some of this other stuff. My point is, is that you, you do all that stuff and you say, all right, I've got a function. It works, it just doesn't work fast enough. How do I squeeze out a little bit more performance? And that's what this talk is going to be about today. So before we begin, the, main, the two main packages I'm going to talk about are going to be Dask and Cython. I really, 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 really like these packages. They make things a ton easier and make things, I can make things way fat, like, unreasonably fast for how simple it is to code because a lot of the stuff can be done uh, in Python. The catch is I'm not going to go into these packages and like, you know, talk about like all the stuff you can do with them and all that. I'm more interested in the customized application of these packages. So my point is, is there's like an unending amount of documentation regarding these two. I highly recommend you go read and look them up because there's much more that can be done than what I'm about to show you here but just realize that there's a lot more than just this type of stuff. Uh, to set this up, you just need to install Cython like you would normally install, install Dask like you would normally install. The one, there's two catches. The one, one catch for Cython is that Cython, we're gonna be compiling code down to C. So in order to do that, you need to have a C compiler so that that can work. Um, you can get one by just installing a VS code and you have, you'll have the C compiler that comes with that. I recommend just installing VS code. So Visual Studio code as opposed to just Visual Studio and then installing the C++ extension. Um, Visual Studio code is a, kind of a lightweight IDE. Um, it's like a modular version of VS code. It's really, I, f I really like it. A lot of people like it a lot. So just, if you just, uh, if you want to use Cython, all you got to do is install that VS Code with that C++ extension. And then if you want to use the visualizations in DAS, which I recommend if you're trying to, especially if you're doing stuff with stuff that's uh, lazy, lazy execution, where you're building a computational graph, um, just know that you have to have the graph is package installed. So let's say you install that there. But once you get those installed, everything else, you should be able to uh, go through this notebook and have it all execute. So I'm going to go ahead and import some Cython and Dask. Okay, so what we're gonna be doing today is simply telling our computer, look, I just want you to count to a billion. So while this, I'm talking, I'm gonna go ahead and run this. Um, um, I'm, and that's what this function here does. It just says, look, I just want you to count to a billion. We're starting from zero, we're going to a billion and we're just gonna count. We're count, 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 and then we're gonna output this result, adding one to it every time we count. And as you can tell, I'm using this in a basic Python for loop. It's super slow. If you're gonna do this, I mean, you would never do this, but if you're gonna do something like this, you wouldn't write it like this in Python. You would write something, something vectorized. So you would ideally use NumPy or something, something that drops more down to C more. But if you're using Python and you might have like a really complicated object or a bunch of different classes that you don't wanna mess with or something like that, my point is, is that 
this function is a stand in for all that stuff. You can just do whatever you want. This is just some, some random operation that you have in Python. Um, in this case, I just made it a really cheesy function, but uh, just be aware, this could be, this could be anything. So we're waiting this, as you can tell, it's taking a very long time to do. Uh, it took a minute, 12 seconds. Uh, there's our results, so we're able to count to a billion. Um, so now let's look over, all right, if I am given this function and I can't alter it in any way, how can I make this faster? One way to do that is by using um, Dask and using a local cluster on Dask or using just any type of cluster. You could have multiple computers that are remote to your system that you're working on. You can have you know jobs submitted to those. You know, this is kind of like a, like the Python version where you have like all the big stuff like Hadoop and you know all sorts of stuff you can work with. But in this case, we're going to be working with Dask. And in order to do that, we need to spin up a cluster. In this case, I'm going to spin up a local cluster. So this is just a cluster that's running on my machine uh, virtually. And to do that, all I have to do, you notice I imported this client here. And then I call this client class. And this client class, it will do one of two things. It'll set up a local cluster or a distributed cluster. Uh, just depending upon like your settings, it automatically detects what it needs to set up. And so this will actually call another class called local cluster and just passes this these arguments right to them in this case, because we're using a local cluster. But what I'm doing is I just start this client class. I say, hey, I want a certain number of workers. In this case, I want eight. And the reason why I want eight is because I have eight cores on my computer. Um, and I'm going to be using processes, not threads, to compute this information. So this is also another really important point I want to drive home is that whatever the type of parallel processing that you're going to be doing if you're using Dask is going to be highly dependent upon the type of problem you're dealing with. So in this case, it's largely computational. We're adding. We're just adding a whole bunch of numbers together. Um, Whereas if you're in a situation where you're dealing with a read-write operation, or you need an operation that needs to be very reactive, you know, for like, let's say you have, like, you're building something for a website, or you have some, like, I don't know, video game or something, um, you're going to be wanting to use threads that share the same memory space and that are allow, ideally, multiple threads per, per core. In this case, um, the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to cut up the inputs and then pipe them out to eight individual cores on my machine um, and across those eight workers. So you can see what I'm doing here is I'm just saying, look, I'm going to give this eight workers and I'm only giving it one thread per worker. So there will not be shared memory space. So this is another really important thing to think about is that if you need something to be processed, it needs to go through processes. And, but when you go through processes, you're not sharing the same memory space. They're all sort of these independent little boxes that are operating on your whatever function or job you've provided the cluster. Um, finally, this memory limit, this is like super important to just be very cautious about how you're managing memory. Um, in this case, I have 32 gigs on this computer that I'm using right here. So I didn't want to go all the way up to those 32 and have my computer crash. So I said, all right, I'm going to give you a maximum of 24, and I'm going to give each worker, you know, its own share of that 24. Um, it's very easy if you're not paying very close attention to memory um, to go over that limit. And if you do in just one worker, it'll crash your whole, your whole project, your whole thing that you're trying to do. Um, it'll, it'll crash your client um, and then cause you issues down the road. So just be very, very, be very cognizant of uh, managing memory and be very cognizant of the type of problem that you're trying to solve or the type of job that you're submitting to your plus, to your cluster because um, the threads and processes are appropriate for different situations. So that's that's the big thing I want to harp on right there. So if I run this using Dask, I'll have this I'll put this little client here. you can see you know, this is what I have up here. We can click on this 
um, this dashboard that it has, and it'll tell me all sorts of information about um, this cluster that we'll see in a moment. Now, actually executing this, what I'll do is I will take, um, you notice I just started with a, a billion here, and then I said range start from zero to a billion. So zero to a billion. What I'm doing now is I'm just cutting those ranges up into eight different pieces, right? So from like one to 100 million, 100 million to 200 million, and then those are just eight groups of those. And then with those chunks, I'm going to submit those chunks all in parallel to have this function process those and then bring in all the results um, in something called uh, futures. So in this case, I'm using DAS futures. And what futures are is they're basically a, a job that is immediately executed upon being submitted to the, uh, to the cluster. So this is not lazy operation. This is, these are futures that are, these are immediately being processed and they're being processed in parallel. And you'll notice that as I submit these and they get appended to this futures, um, this futures list object here, um, it's not blocking. So none of this blocks. It just gets all, all executed as these futures get set up. These are basically each one of these are like a job. And you're telling your computer, hey, I'm setting up all these jobs and I'm appending them to this futures list. And then just start executing those jobs as soon as they come in. And then this gather futures, this says, this just says I'm going to block and I'm not going to let any code execute until all the futures have finished. And I'm going to pull the results. Um, into this object I'm calling results. So what's significant about this is that not only is the um, is this are these functions being executed in parallel, but on top of that, they um, they come out in order. So I think that's a really a really big thing because when you're dealing with anything where you're trying to process things in parallel, that order can be very important. And depending upon what you're doing, you're gonna get um, all sorts of issues if you're not being very, very cognizant of that. So if I run this, adding this time thing, we should be able to see here how fast this will take. You can see in the task stream, uh, a task gets submitted, it gets processed, and in each one of these, uh, each one of these workers is processing um, each of its own its own independent task. And so, instead of waiting a minute and twelve seconds, we're only waiting eleven point four seconds. So you can see here that I didn't change any of this. I just said instead of doing this on one process, let's use all the resources on my computer, or at least a lot more of them. And I can just do the same thing a lot faster. So obviously the speed up is not going to be, it's not gonna map directly um, to the size of your cluster. That's gonna be highly dependent upon the job um, that you're asking it to do. So just be aware of that and be aware that, you know, managing memory is really important. If you get any memory bottlenecks, that's going to dramatically slow down your jobs that you're piping out. So you really need a lot of memory and remember that you know, if you're split up equally across all of your workers, you're going to need, you know, a pretty significant amount of memory because this ends up being only like three gigabytes per worker or something. So if you have any operations that require um, more memory than that inside of a worker, you're going to run into issues. Um, so this is just me putting everything together. You can see that it's really not all that much talking through this again. All I did is this is just me breaking up chunking out that uh, the job um, of counting to a billion. So instead of counting from zero to a billion, I just count from zero to some number, that some number to another number all the way to a billion across these eight chunks. I submit them. The syntax is just like you would see in a normal for loop. I'm just giving it the chunk start, the chunk end. Um, you can see I'm calling this client that I had started up here. And this is me, uh, I call the submit function to submit the count function. I just provide it with my inputs that go that would go into um, here, start and end. And then 
that comes out as a future. I pin the future to my futures list, and then I block until they're all finished, and then I get the results. And if we, if I said, you can see that um, that's exactly what we were expecting. All these futures have counted up these eight different chunks. If I add them all up, I get a billion. Okay, and now, that we've seen all that. The other option I want to point out is there's something called lazy evaluation, which is different than futures in that futures, at the point of creation for future, it is immediately being executed. Lazy evaluation is different in that when you create, you submit something to a delayed or a lazy or something, you are telling your computer, hey, I don't want you to execute this, but here's the job that I'm providing you um, that I want you to be prepared to execute. So you build something called a task graph where it's literally just a graph of tasks to be executed by the computer up front. And then once you have that task graph, you know, you have it built in the way that you'd like, that's when you say, computer, now execute all of this task graph for me. Um, so it's a way of managing, um, working with things in parallel that makes it a lot easier in a lot of ways. Um, probably the big, the most significant thing about using task graphs is that you can make a task graph, but then you can continue to add on to that task graph. So in this case, we have the same sort of setup. I have the same function that I was working with. Um, I have the same chunks. I have the same syntax here. And the only thing I did is now I have, instead of appending the futures that I'm submitting immediately to the client to be executed, I say DAS delayed. So this just says, don't execute this, add it to the task graph. Um, and then I'm submitting my function along with the inputs. So I run this and you'll notice, you know, it executes immediately because it hasn't done any work yet. It's just set up the task graph. So if we visualize the task graph, you can see this is um, the first the first delayed that's in this lazies list. This is what the task graph looks like. So if you imagine, um, you know, you just have eight of these in parallel. That's what our task graph is currently looking like. And then to have that executed, all I have to do is say, all right, now compute um, all of these delays. And then it basically does the same thing that we are doing with the futures. But the difference being that we built a task graph first, and then once we are satisfied with it, we decided to execute those results. And so you can see that we end up with the exact same thing that we had before. Um, and that will end up with the same results. Um, and you can tell that it was about the same amount of times, about close to 12 seconds. So a lot faster than just using um, using normal function. And so here's a part that I want to point out. We have this function that we've uh, appended to these lazies, um, these delayed objects. I can also make new functions and add those to the task graph. So for example, in this scenario, what I did here is I took um, in each one of these uh, delayed objects, I said, okay, let's take that delayed object and now let's add two new functions onto our task graph. So in this case, I'm adding um, chunk DEC, and this is just subtracting off 100 million, just something random. And then I have chunk diff, which is taking the difference between the original amount and the subtraction. So pointless functions, but as you can tell, it's really easy to add to this task graph. And so the coolest part about this is, is that you can make functions that are set up in such a way where you don't know what the user is going to add on to them. You can just output this task graph. And then the user can come in and say, all right, well, I got that output that I wanted, but I need to add on this stuff to the task graph before the parallel computation occurs. And so that uh, this task graphs allow you to be very modular with that. And so then if we run this, we'll end up with a new set of results where we have the output um, and the, from the first task graph being transformed by these two functions in this task graph.
And so there's the results there. Um, and so th those are the two ways of using Dask in a completely custom orientation. So what I mean is to contrast that with other objects that exist in Dask. You'll, you know, if you're Googling Dask and stuff, you'll probably see stuff on Dask bags, Dask data frames, all of these pre-built objects that have, um, you know, that might be like Dask, uh, Dask data frames based on pandas data frames that get split up um, simulated like we've been splitting up here, um, but they have pandas uh, working for each worker. So you have a pandas data set on each worker doing something and they all do stuff together to produce some result that you know makes sense given your context. But in this case, you can see, you can just submit your own, whatever it is you want. It could be anything you want. So that's Dask. Now, the next thing I want to show is just how this how these same concepts can be applied using Cython. Um, not to program things in a parallel fashion and submitting them to a client like we did with Dask, but instead to get Python to tap into that um, lower base language of C, which is much, much faster than Python. And there are many things you can do to write Cython code. You can literally write C code and just have it work, you know, have it compiled and then set it up in such a way that you can have it run in Python. You can write Cython code, which is kind of a blending of Python and Cython. And you can write actually pure Python code where you're importing the package Cython and then you just end up compiling, compiling this later. So for example, here, um, Jupyter has this really, really, these really nice magic functions for Cython, or Cython has this really nice magic functions for Jupyter. And you can actually compile by just running this magic function inside of the notebook. So you don't actually have to compile it into a separate file that you then have to import into your package and work from there. Obviously you wanna do that if you're actually building your library based on Cython. Um, but if you're just using something in a Jupyter notebook, you can use it really fast by just using these magic functions, which are awesome. Here I'm using this annotate method to look at our original function to see, okay, where, where are the slowdowns happening? So if I type, by typing this magic with this annotate for this function, it highlights all of the pieces that hint at Python interaction. And those are the parts that are gonna, that are gonna be really, really slow. So in this case, you can see um, obviously, anytime you're defining a function in, that's in Python, that's going to hint at Python interaction. But for the for loop, this is really bad because this is saying this for loop is just going right to Python. And if you know anything about for loops in Python, it's going to be really, really slow. So instead of doing it that way, we could write this in, in Cython. So in this case, I've imported Cython, and here is me writing this out in the uh, Cython syntax. And you can see the only difference between this function that we had before and this new function is I'm declaring my types. So the way you write code in Python, you don't have to declare anything. It all just kind of figures it out on itself, on its own. That makes, that makes it super easy to just write things that just work. Um, but the cost of that is, significant performance impact on the execution of your code. So in this scenario, um, instead of relying on Python to figure this out for me, I'm telling my computer, hey, I already know this is an int. So it's going to be an integer and you're not going to have to worry about it. This end variable is going to be an integer. You're not going to have to worry about it. The result is going to be an integer and it's going to have a default value of zero. And so you're not going to have to worry about that. And then once I do that, we run the same annotate magic function. And we can see, look, this for loop now has been completely removed from um, the parts that were interacting with Python. So this for loop now is going to C. It's not going to Python anymore. And what's awesome about that, I just ran this. You can see it happens effectively instantaneously because we're completely skipping the Python level. And as you notice, it's, I mean, it's just faster. It's, Instead of waiting, what was it, one minute and 11 seconds, I can wait effectively zero time and get a result immediately by having this pre-compiled um, Python code that's ready to go. So um, 
Are there any questions up to this point? Because I am almost finished. <laughs> Like parallelization is great, but you should just learn C. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, here's a kicker. If you look at the way I've I've written this to run, it feels like Python. You can take this and you can, in theory, plug it into Dask. Mm -hmm. So I've never been in a situation where I need that much more performance increase. But there is, there is, um, these two things are not mutually exclusive. Is what I'm trying to say, and they can be used together. So you could write your Python program in C using Cython. Just these type of declarations, you're going to get massive performance increases. You're going to even, and there's other ways to get tons of performance increases that go beyond that. I, you know, didn't want to go into everything that uh, Cython does because there's just it's endless. There's a ton of documentation on it, but the key is you can write this function in Cython and then you can put it in Dask. And if you wanted to add up you know, some crazy amount of numbers, you know, it makes more sense to write really efficient code and then pipe it out to all the resources on your computer. So I guess what I'm trying to say is there's two concepts here. Here's how you can make Python code fast by just with, just with type declarations. And, here, and then you can also make it faster by using all the resources that are available to you. Um, and the last thing I wanted to show you guys is just, um, the notation difference between here and here. This is a more of a pure Python um, syntax. This is actually just Cython. So you can see here, there's this, there's different notations for defining functions. Um, and I, I'm personally am more privy to this. You end up with less code. It's more C-like and you can, it's more explicit when you're defining a function, um, whether it's gonna interact with Python or C. So for example, def, by itself is just Python. C def, your function's going to just C, and CP def is, uh, it can go to C or Python. And you're probably gonna have to do both if you're doing, you know, depending upon what your function looks like. But you can see the syntax is slightly different, but it's not that different. In this case, we're just saying, you know, our function is gonna result in an int. This start is gonna be an int. This end is gonna be defined as an int. I'm going to define this as a s in C as, this result uh, object in C as an integer with a value starting at zero. So all this is basically the same, it's just a different syntax. Um, and you can see here it runs exactly, it's the same thing. Um, as we run this, you can see that nothing really touches. Um, once we use a function, the only reason we have this, this, at, this touches Python is all because I defined it to be able to touch Python, but everything else goes right to C and it's super fast. So obviously when you're programming in C, um, depending upon what you're trying to do, it can be pretty demanding in comparison to coding in Python, but Cython allows you a really nice middle ground between those two where you can get, you know, Python is almost always fast enough, but when you're using Cython, you can just push yourself over that threshold whenever you get stuck. So uh, that's all I have to, talk about today. Let me know if anybody has any questions. Um, hopefully somebody got something out of it. <laughs> oh, it was great. Um, yeah, we have some questions here. I guess first though, anyone online with questions? Okay. Do you, uh, we have questions here. Uh, yeah, so... Uh... You may have to come up so you can, the speaker's somewhere in here, if you don't mind, after. Uh, hey, Garrett, uh, this is Shubham. Uh, I have a question regarding uh, Dask implementation. So when we declare the uh, clusters or the workers for parallelism, how is data dependency taken care of? Because here we are just adding some. So that's why it's making, giving us what uh, the desired answer like sum of 125 million, eight times give you 1 billion. But how if all the worker jobs are data dependent? Like how can we use it? Uh, so the motive behind this question, uh, I'm implementing the same thing in Julia and I'm facing problems using data dependency because all my parallel processes are not returning the answer in the same sequence. 
So, and so my wondering... understanding of what your problem is, is that each worker is be receiving data and to do some process, right? But each worker, the data that they receive and the function that they're executing is not independent of the other workers. Is that correct? Correct. Okay, so that is gonna, okay. It depends on what you're doing. If you have to compute things um, with processes, you're not gonna be able to do it this way using Dask. And the main reason why is because like you said, they, your, your workers are working independently from each other. They have their own memory spaces. However, they, um, the, the, the function or the process or the job that you're submitting to those workers is, needs data that's not independent. So I would recommend, first of all, usually there's a way that you can, you can pipe things out so that you can actually make it independent if you're clever with it. But I would also recommend thinking about if this is a more appropriate for multi-processing, parallel processing with threads. Um, because if you're not doing some massive computation, if you're doing something that's more read-write bound, um, you can keep all the, you can, you can process things on multiple threads um, and keep them on like one core, for example, and you're going to get pretty significant speed ups because the way that works is imagine you have your core sitting in front of you and you're submitting a job inside of a thread to that core. But that mm -hmm. job is waiting on, let's say, your hard drive to read some data. So it's just sitting there. The core isn't doing anything. So if you submit another thread, that core that, let's say, you have your cores can do multi-threading because obviously this wouldn't be too advantageous if it couldn't do that. But the core can look at the second thread and begin processing that one while it's waiting for that first one. And that's how you get performance uh, benefits um, when you're doing multi-threading, even though if you're only hitting, let's say, a single core. Um, the disadvantage is, is that, you know, if you have something that needs, that's actually going to do a lot of heavy lifting, you're going to need to do stuff in the process. And, um, you know, if you're, if you're threading, they share, the, they share the same memory space. So that's the advantage. The disadvantage is, is that, um, the only advantage to threading is if you're just waiting on something all the time. You're not, your, your processor isn't, or the core that you're working on isn't doing a lot of work. So if it's not doing a lot of work, I would recommend you look at trying to use threads. If it is doing a lot of work, I would recommend trying to think through a good way that you can independently split this job up across your cluster. If that doesn't work, um, I would highly recommend if you're doing stuff in Python, which you know you mentioned you might be doing something else, but if you can move to a lower level language, uh, that's, I mean, that will probably solve your problem if you're working in a, um, a language that's slower. But from what I know about Julia, it's faster than Python. Uh, yes. So lot. we are actually implementing multi threads. We are not uh, implementing clusters there. But uh, so the results of each of the threads are not in synchronous. So um, what we were looking for a solution is how can, so say we have eight workers as you're pointing uh, mm -hmm. to, the, uh, to the notebook. So for us, it's like the first worker is dependent. Uh, so second worker's result uh, should be integrated with first worker. So the worker result should be in sync. So now, if you, if you, um, what you can do is you can use something called a semaphore. Do you use those? Um, no, we haven't explored that. Okay. Well, a semaphore, all that will do is it will, it allows a max number of leases to the mm -hmm. cluster. So you can have things being processed one at a time, and then you can build a task graph lazily, um, mm -hmm. like we're doing down here. And then you can submit that task graph and then have it only operate on, you know, so many things in a certain time. You can have, you know, you know what you should do, actually. You should explore, um, instead of submitting things immediately, it sounds like you're submitting them immediately, the job immediately for the cluster to be processed. Is that right? Yes. Okay. I would look at doing, evaluating it lazily, where you build the task graph out first, 
And if there's mm -hmm. any parallelism that's happening in the task graph, um, that will give you performance improvements because in the task graph, you can define, wait for this job to complete before you start the next job. Like here, let me see if I can find an example. See if we find an image here. So here, it looks like this. So um, as you're starting with these X amount of different jobs, um, these jobs are executing. And then this right here, all the stuff that's happening in parallel, this is gonna result in performance increases. But for this to be processed, you need to have access to this job, this job, let's see, this job, this job, this job, and this job over here, right? So once these are finished, then you process this one. But same thing with this one, you gotta wait for this one, this one, this one, and this one to finish, then you can process this one. So what'll happen is that the, your cluster will go through this task graph, executing these. And then when it gets to here, it'll execute all these, and then it'll get up to this one. And if these aren't finished, it'll wait for these to finish, right? It'll go and send its workers down here to finish these nodes. And once those nodes get finished, then it'll go to these nodes because it needs these pieces to go up here. So I would really explore um, setting up a task graph and having things executed lazily in your situation because you might have, um, like the only case you're not gonna have parallelism is if your task graph looks like this. It's just literally like this one goes to here, 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 goes to here. Goes to here. If that's your case, you're, then you can't parallelize what you're trying to do. But if you have some things that can, you know, cause this right here, just this part of the graph itself is, can't be parallelized, but all this stuff can, all this stuff can be run at the same time. So mm -hmm. I'd recommend going down that route. Um, and then the semaphore I just mentioned is literally just a limitation on your, it's a way of limiting um, how many leases you're getting, but I was thinking like maybe you could code a way around like waiting for um, certain parts of your job to finish, but that's going to be too complicated. It'll, it'll be much easier to do things, have things executed lazily and build a task graph. So my hope to you is that your task graph might look something like this, but if it looks something like this, you can't parallelize it and take advantage of a cluster. Can I ask a question, Garrett? Yeah, yeah. So go back to the other graph. Yeah. So let's say that your right hand function there, like above the halfway point, up a little from there, that one, let's say it's a much more complicated thing that it's doing than mm -hmm. the other. Can you give it more? workers or more space because it's a more complicated task like you just divided everything up into eight pieces you gave everyone the same amount of ram and stuff can my you parse it out differently if you wanted it in theory might be possible i don't know how to do it um on dask that the assumption is is that you're just defining all the workers and you define them to be equal and then the um, the, the client manages how those workers are assigned to each workload. And under the assumption that all the workers are the same, it just, you know, assigns basically the first one to the next workload. Um, so if you have workers that aren't equal, um, um, your, the task manager would have to be able to account for that. And I don't know how to make that happen in Dask. That's not something that um, you see happening often because what will happen usually is you'll go through and you'll get to this and then Dask will be processing this, but it sends the other workers over to here to do these other smaller processes. So um, there's no way to do that that I know of. It might, in theory, it's, I think it would be possible, but it would heavily complicate the way these uh, these clients work. Yeah, I have no idea of an example that would require it. I was just wondering. Yeah, and usually what happens is, is if you have a big job like this, usually people split it up into smaller jobs so that you can yeah. stick different workers on them. So normally instead of people dealing with like 
trying to get the task manager to do this crazy weird job. They just make their code easier for the task manager to understand. That's usually how I see it playing out. Any other questions? Uh, one small, so in your notebook, there are uh, this a concept called as futures. Is it similar to the re reduce function? Is it a reducing function that uh, like collects all the results of the workers? That's what this uh, gather function does. So when I run this, this features, um, you can actually have it be like, like you just mentioned where the features are submitted and they're running and then your code doesn't block. So you can still keep doing other things while these features are compute, being computed in the background. This clients that gather just, this is me putting this in here to say, hey, I just wanna block until the results are done because you might need to wait for those results to happen. So you could have a job that's running in the background, run some different code and then call the client gather uh, function to block your code to then have it finish afterwards. So I think let's find here, if we have futures, you have fire and forget. Um, So you can, you can wait for features to finish. You can do the um, gather, like I was just showing you. You have these fire and forget where you just say, hey, just make the task run. Um, and it doesn't matter even if you release and allow multiple things to keep running. Um, so there are like a lot of different options for these features objects. Um, and there's ways of blocking and not blocking. You don't have to block like I'm doing here. I guess is what all I'm trying to say. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, good, thank you. Cool. Any other questions? I guess, can you do like an example? I am mean, counting to a billion was good because it showed the time easily, but what's an example from your work where you found I, I kind of know, but can you describe an example of when you yep. have used? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, I'm literally using this uh, like like an hour ago. So what I'll do is at the CFTC we have a new uh, data warehouse um, for AWS. Uh, it's called a it's called Redshift. They have these different data warehouses, but the one we're using is Redshift. It's this Columnar database that's based on um, Postgres SQL, uh, but it's own, it's, its own dialect. Um, so that has some market data that's stored in S3. And in order to access this data, because it's so large, it has to be in S3, you have to go to uh, Redshift, ask for, you know, submit some type of a query, and then Redshift will go and spin up these things called spectrum layers to in parallel pull in the information. So a lot of the times this data sets that exist there are um, unanonymized market data for coming from the CME. So oftentimes if I'm doing an investigation into somebody, I need to pull that one person's data. So I'm literally looking for the needle in the haystack. And the way the data is organized right now, there's some changes happening, but the way it is right now, what you have to do is you can use a lookup table to identify what dates to look at because the, um, the data is bucketed by date. So I can go quickly to one date, but inside of that date, I have to search through the entire uh, order entries data set for that particular uh, instrument. Which is a which is of a particular market. So an instrument is like um, like a particular contract for a particular commodities. So you'd have like I think ZC is corn. So you'd have like ZCU eight. So ZC is corn. U is I think it's corn. U is uh, some month. I forget the the codes don't map up to something that's 
easily identifiable, but let's say it's like March or something. And then eight is the year. So I'm looking for the futures dealing with corn for let's say March of 2008 or something or 2018. Um, and I want a particular person to be pulled out of there. In order to get that, if I just ran a normal, if I just sent it a normal SQL query, it's gonna take forever because it has to search across this entire spectrum of the, the whole market for this instrument. It has to look for across every single person in that market. So in order to make this much faster, you can split this out into multiple different queries across multiple different jobs. And then all those queries are being executed in parallel. So something that might take me, you know, hours to finish only takes me, you know, 10, 15 minutes, which is really important because the uh, lease for these temporary credentials expire from like the security settings that we have within an hour, which means that um, the way we have things working, if the query doesn't finish within an hour because it has to be unloaded back into S3 due to some more complicated mechanisms that we have, um, it won't finish. So the thing, it has to finish within an hour. And so to get it to finish within an hour, I have to do something like this to make it work. So that's a real world example that I use all the time. Hmm. That's great. So how big are those S3 buckets? Uh, they're massive, petabyte yeah. scale. Um, the data is very, very large, especially, and that's just futures and spreads. If you're considering options, which are much, much larger, it gets pretty, pretty big. Um, and so imagine having to scan across a petabyte worth of data. You know, you wouldn't actually be looking across that. You'd be looking across a lot, though. Um, you can see how yeah. it, it's going to take a long time if you don't if you don't use all the resources that you have available to you. Cool. So as I said, everyone, he does really cool things. Um, so thank you, Garrett. And then go ahead and turn off the recording before I forget.